So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much. Mike, uh, tell us who you are and what you do. So I'm Mike Halsell. Uh, of course, we know each other through Singularity University, uh, that project uh, out of Google and NASA that's currently sort of a little bit dormant. It's great to be here in Bergamo, the most beautiful parts of the world. So I, I do three three sections to what I do. The first thing is in the UK government, uh, I was involved in establishing with others the Civil Service Innovation Programme competition, which was about upgrading civil and crown servants in the UK. That morphed into what we call the Emerging Tech Radar, which is a series of events to inform civil and sound crown servants about technologies that are going to have a very significant effect on all of our lives going forward. The second thing that I do is I run a guest lecture series uh, every year at UCL in the autumn term, again on broadly emerging technologies and geopolitics and how that relates to financial markets. And then the third section area in which I operate is in relation to advising companies that are involved in developing emerging technologies such as quantum computing and more, more importantly high temperature superconducting components which of course drive nuclear fusion, the transmission of electricity without loss, and magnetic storage and so forth. That's me in a nutshell. Superposition, as it were, yeah. of the pandemic and Brexit impacting the UK. Well, at the moment, obviously the pandemic, ignoring the dog barking in the background, obviously this is, this is a, uh, a remain a voting dog. Uh, the, the pandemic has caused all economies to go in a state of sort of frozen subjectivity to an extent. So we wait and see really what Brexit looks like when the money starts to flow properly in what I would call a natural economic system. I think that uh, I, I personally would prefer to have remained, but obviously now that we've Brexited, one must go with this concept of of having done so. Uh, so the pandemic, I think, has put the braking system on understanding what the output might be. Brexit, of course, does give Britain the ability, from a regulatory point of view, as you said earlier, uh, to do things differently, more fleet of foot, which might be faster. On the other hand, of course, it has to establish trade agreements, and by doing so, it must take on board the limitations that are inherent in trade agreements. So uh, I'm afraid to say the answer is that it's work in progress uh, as to see whether uh, or which trading bloc Britain aligns with most, which is really what's going to happen after Brexit. Britain is not an island uh, economically, it's part of a global system. So uh, your initiative, the uh, Emerging Tech Radar, yeah. uh, wants to upgrade sure. uh, the vocabulary and uh, the ability to both listen and to speak about sure. technology and the impact of technology in society for mm -hmm. civil servants and the Crown. Yes. Uh, but it potentially goes beyond the UK as well. Uh, why is that important in your view? Well, at the moment, if you're a government minister, you probably don't have any or very much STEM competence at all. I'm not being nasty to government ministers. The STEM route is not the route to become a government minister. So, as it were, a question of survival bias, you don't get people in STEM in government. But, of course, they, 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 they set policy, they determine what must happen next, both from in terms of uh, regulations and in terms of financial investment and in terms of education. So, clearly... There needs to be an upgrade into the language of science and technology into policymakers and people who are advising them so that they know what it is about quantum computing, quantum physics, blockchain, cryptocurrencies. They must understand these things so that they can have conversations in the language in which they need to be speaking to people such as yourself, entrepreneurs, investors who are affecting that change and making it all happen. So the Emerging Tech Radar is about that sort of upgrade of not just vocabulary, but really learning the language of science and technology. Uh, and of course, yes, it must be, and it is beyond the, the British government. It's sponsored by part of the British government who sort of hosts the whole thing. It's all digital these days, of course. It used to be physical, and now it's become a quarterly event. But the idea is for it to catalyze conversations across government and into the Crown so that people then can make uh, what I would say are more informed decisions once they're able to speak the language of science and technology. Um, of course, you can only teach uh, those that are ready, ready to learn. Mm -hmm. Did you find that uh, a good percentage hmm. of your target audience realized that they would benefit from, from this and they were ready to engage and to embark themselves in the journey? Yes. The level of excitement is very, very high and the references obtain post-events. To my surprise, I mean, people are, uh, I mean, I remember 
jumping into a lift with a couple of ladies when it used to be a physical event. And this was sort of at lunchtime going out for, and they were out to smoke and I was going out for a beer, as I recall. I hope that's not an improper thing to say. But I jumped into the lift with the two of them and they said they had never been exposed to having to think so much for two days. In fact, at that stage, it was one and a half days. It was almost the, the last session was next. But they had never had to think so much in their lives before. So that it's a, it's a bit like if you want to learn a language, if you want to learn Espanol starting today, you have to start speaking that language. You cannot just carry on with English. And I think what they were saying was that they felt that they were being sort of physically, mentally moved into a space they'd never been before. And I thought that was great. So although these days, of course, it's physical for the reasons of the pandemic, it is very important that we make it on a more regular basis, physical and uh, in person, sorry, in person and virtual, so, so that we can make sure that, that we're getting the, not just the conveying of knowledge to them, but that they themselves as groups are explaining and collaborating amongst each other. A bit like a, a playground full of young children. Um, what is the uh, measurable outcome that uh, you would like to be able to find uh, after a given number of these uh, events? KPIs, they call them. I mean, uh, I think that the me measurable is in the sense, you know, where, where government at high level is having conversations. I mean, I suppose what, what I would like to see is that if you've got five or six government ministers of any government, whatever government it might be, and they're having a conversation about quantum computing and what must be done about it. If we can attain that level of improvement, as it were, linguistically in science and technology, dynamically in that sense, then I think that is ultimately what we would want to achieve. So that they can really know who to go and talk to, what is it they're going to be saying, and what must happen next. At the moment, in the British government, and all governments, you have these, sort of, they call them special advisors, they're called SPADs in terms of acronym. And a minister will rely on a, his or her entourage. They will go to a SPAD. And then you have all this lobbying complication around that that inevitably happens. So you don't have what I would call a fluent conversation between the raw entrepreneur who's got this vision like a Wright Brothers person. You need those people, I think, to be explaining to a British government minister in a way that everybody can understand. So when we come to dealing with the... Uh, an emerging tech has, for example, uh, synthetic biology. So, and the combinations of that. So synthetic biology meets AI, say, as it obviously already is, inevitably. Then that is a conversation that we need to start to have. We might say we should regulate against this. This mustn't happen. But who's we? We as a government, as a country, as it were. What do other governments do? So in the Far East, uh, governments out there, which are more autocratic, might say, well, actually... We're going to invest into this. We think it's got a big future. So again, I think that the answer to the question must be that we want to make as many people fluent in the language of science and technology so that the, the policy becomes well more likely to be uh, more accurate in its estimation as to what it is that they should be doing next. Um, blockchain technologies in their various um, implications uh, as a... Uh, tool of uh, financial empowerment and inclusion uh, yeah. as a tool of uh, transparency and accountability, right. um, as uh, a, a tool of uh, the designing and implementation of new business models more conducive to a future of autonomous machines, sure. um, uh, uh, are extremely intriguing. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, fairly difficult mm. to explain, to grasp, mm. and to regulate. Sure. Um, from your uh, perspective and based on the experience of uh, the emerging technology radar, mm. um, how is uh, the UK positioned in uh, its ability to regulate uh, or, or very lightly regulate? Uh, sure. how, what, what do you think is happening in this area in the UK? Well, the UK is generally quite competent in science and technology, I think, in broad terms. I would say atmospherically it has competence. Obviously, the more of that that goes into uh, civil and crown servants and regulators, the better. Of course, the, the UK has these sandboxes in the, in the financial world that have proven to be quite good in the sense that in a sandbox, you can make mistakes 
and not go to jail. Because, of course, if you're in the space of, you know, innovation in fintech, you can find yourself in very serious trouble very quickly. So the concept of a sandbox was a good idea. That I'm not sure where it came from, but the UK was very, very strong in adopting it. The UK government also has a thing called the Government Office for Science, which is sort of reduced to go science. Of course, at the moment, it's sort of focusing on, on the pandemic, on COVID. But I was part of one of the advisors to the distributed ledger, go science document produced in 2015, but it was released, I think, in, in 2016 or maybe 14 to 15. And that at the time was reasonably advanced. Uh, for a government. So that informs a lot of people about what distributed ledger and as a subset of that, what blockchain might be. So I, I would say that the, the government is at the moment, I'm cautiously optimistic that the, that the UK is able to synthesize the opportunities with the regulation to produce something that, that will be conducive towards making innovation happen, but doing so without breaking out of the regulatory space, which of course can cause all sorts of difficulties. Uh, one of the advantages of the UK as uh, um, a breeding ground for successful startups and a virtuous ecosystem mm. um, has been uh, identified uh, to be found in its uh, very favorable taxation system, right. where 50% mm. or if you are even at a high, higher risk uh, bracket in your investment, 90% mm. of the money that you put in mm. startups uh, is basically guaranteed by the, the government because you right. can deduct it from your taxes if uh, it Just ends sure. up being a loss. Yes. yes. Um, according to some observers, mm. uh, there is a surprising bipartisan support mm. for eliminating Mm. or at least reducing these tax benefits mm -hmm. that could potentially end up breaking uh, the um, positive momentum that uh, um, certainly mm. uh, across uh, the European continent, but um, also on a worldwide basis, uh, the UK has enjoyed. Sure. What, what is your thinking around it? Uh, wh where does this opposition come from? and, and uh, what will the outcome be? Well, we have a Tory government now for a while longer, so I think that uh, we, we see what happens next as to whether the Tories get another term uh, or whether Labour, as it were, under uh, Keith Starmer can get back into power. I, I think the anxiety is broadly wealth distribution, is that if you're a wealthy person, you can afford to invest into a technology company, then why should everybody else carry the risk but not get the return for that? The reward for that. So I suppose in that sense that that is probably where the uh, anxiety comes from, which is which is a rational fear, I must say. On the other hand, of course, you do need to incentivize investors to put money into technologies that are high risk, because of course, you know, high risk means, you know, you've got a 5% of success. So if I'm not going to get any tax back on that, then can I take that 5% risk? That, that, that is the, the great, the great sort of conundrum that we have to deal with is, on the one hand, we have to incentivize people to take risk. On the other hand, of course, we must make sure that wealth distribution is fair. Wealth and risk distribution, of course, are fair. So it could be an area in which maybe, you know, blockchain technologies mean that we can share risk and reward while still incentivizing people. So smaller checks, as it were, and more deductibility. So, so, so I think that is an example where we might see some innovation dynamic that enables us to as I say, share risk and reward in a way that the Tories on the one hand and the Labour guys on the other can come to some sort of long-term obligation to one another to accept this essential paradigm being that we must drive more financial capital into technologies that will drive industries of the future. And, and, and there is um, a historical precedent to that because uh, in uh, traditional, not blockchain, but traditional crowdfunding, right. The UK has been uh, spearheading yeah. uh, innovation and acquiring mm. momentum yeah. that puts it far ahead uh, any other uh, country, sure. including the, the US, that yes. hobbled its own legislation with excessive regulation. Right. Um, so what I guess you see mm. is a further strengthening mm. and broadening of uh, the ability to people yeah. of people to participate in in crowdfunding sure. uh, startups and and high risk uh, investment opportunities yeah
Yes, the UK has been for a long time a sort of a, a bastion of science and technology, which pervades people generally. So I think that that excitement in new technologies means that, that people are conducive towards investing into them. And crowdfunding, of course, is beyond technology. There are also crowdfunding platforms into other things such as real estate and so on. But but I think I think it is a dynamic of the, of the British people to take some risk. And I think the government were very good, actually, in understanding and encouraging the environment in which that can happen. So... Uh what do you see the next uh, steps and uh, the evolution of your activities in the next year or two? So I think that you know, with Brexit, there is this tendency to sort of become a bit more insular, which is exactly what we must not do. We've separated ourselves from Europe, uh, principally for you know, regulatory and immigration matters, I suppose, which is what caused that vote to swing that way. But we mustn't actually do that. We must go out more. So I think next steps for the radar and other things that we're doing is to interoperate more with the Italian government, the German government and elsewhere, uh, and, and see how much innovation juice we can squeeze out of the Europeans, of which there is an unending supply. So I think that what we, what we need to be doing is creating the environment in which we see a lot more collaboration across borders uh, to make sure that ultimately there aren't really intellectual borders anymore. I think that's the, the answer to the question, I guess. Wonderful, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. Thank you.